Hi everyone, I'm here with Kelly Kay of Josephson Microphones, um, another one of these super genius members of the Josephson Thanks. team. It's just like David, uh, always an education whenever you have the opportunity to speak to these guys about microphones and technology and we were just talking about it earlier. You know, Josephson is one of the few companies that is continuing to move the bar, um, continuing to actually develop and engineer new products that answer real world solutions and one of their new products being not only the C716 microphone, right. but the actual uh, grill, the acoustic grill that they've created for this thing. And, and Kelly, maybe you just tell us a little bit more about the technology behind the grill and, and more about the uh, 716 microphone as well. Yes, yes, I'll, I'll start off with the grill. Um, and, and thanks for your introduction, oh, Todd. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, the grill is actually something independent of, of the model. Uh, that we've been talking about in the shop forever. Basically, it was our goal. We knew if we wanted to up the game in uh, microphones, you have to get rid of existing problems. And as time goes on, uh, figuring out what's wrong with current microphones gets harder and harder and harder. And to me, uh, with the background in physical acoustics and engineering acoustics, um, the thing that I always saw as a problem, particularly in uh, large side address microphones, is they have a headband often and these side bands or sometimes a horseshoe of a band over the top. And they also have a basket, but the basket has all the surface of the basket and the thickness of it concentrated in a plane. And if you're a studio, a recording studio designer, you know right away Wow, parallel sidewalls, that's a problem, it's not cool. Uh, not broken up, you're gonna have a standing wave. Like if I got a uh, solid uh, grill here, solid grill here, a half a wavelength can fit in it and you've got a resonance. That's how you get these nasal sibilant amplifying uh, problems in a mic basket. In a recording studio, these would be lower frequencies because the spaces are longer, but it turns out in the basket, oftentimes, they fall in the, in the range where the presence uh, rise is, which also corresponds with uh, and sharp uh, vocals, particularly sometimes uh, females with squeakier voices. Um, Often when people get loud as well. Yeah, and when they get loud, yes. Yes, and so, you know, we like to react as well on what do, what do our customers need, and while we don't talk to all our customers, we do talk with our dealers, and that's actually a, a point about our company. We work directly with our dealers. So, we work with Todd, we're not strangers to each other, and I can ask Todd, what do your customers need? Well, it turned out that not only were we looking to solve this problem, but it was exacerbating what we were told was a, a problem in the market, that you know, there's lots of mics out there, but when they're trying to pick one for a very strident, uh, sibilant uh, singer, that then, then it became more difficult to find a mic for folks. Well, great. The one thing you want to do is get rid of any kind of basket resonance, because that's a ringing and it'll just amplify that problem, and we were already trying to figure out that problem. So, the key was, how are we going to do that? Because if you don't have those arms, those are the things that are actually keeping the basket from falling in Structure, on itself or yeah. falling over. And so we knew what we wanted to do, but how do you do it? And luckily, there's actually a third partner that no one's meeting right now, Dave Gordon, back at the shop, whose expertise is manufacturing. And he goes to uh, manufacturers' trade shows, much like this, but they'll have rubbers and drills and people that provide services. And luckily, he was full on, wide awake, walking down, <laughs> seeing saw that, saw that, saw that before. And he came upon a vendor with this material and his eyes popped out of his head and we're like, right, it's done. And so we had been thinking about this forever and finally found the me missing piece of the puzzle. So that's, that's how this came to birth, is we finally figured out the last piece, how to get this to work. And what it is, is if it looks like, and normally I would touch it and squeeze it, but we're actually using it as the mic for the folks listening, <laughs> um, is, is it looks like windscreen foam. It's, it's almost what you think it is. Normally you would have a polymer that you would pour into whatever matrix to get that structure. Instead they pour metal in. So this is just like windscreen foam, but it's solid aluminum machined out of a block of this foam. And so what that allows us to do is, is continuously have no sidebars. And unlike screen, which is in a plane, instead the foam is over a distance. Just like a studio designer will see a wall like this 
and he'll put geometric structures on it to break it, break it up or splay it. So rather than have screen, screen, you have distribution of screen, distribution of screen. And so where you would have parallel sidewalls, if you can imagine my head, hands as an FFT response being a resonance frequency, skinny and tall, when you, when you take that wall and instead distribute it over space, it becomes a wider resonance and a lower resonance to the point that you don't hear it. If I had a resonance at one narrow band and someone's going tss, tss, tss over top of it, it's, it's going to make it sound horrible. Not only that, if your response is brightened by something that's ringing, uh, sometimes it may have a really sharp resonance associated. Sometimes it may contradict something phase-wise and have a, a notch filter associated with it. And those are great problems to equalize. They don't equalize well. So that gets rid of the response issues that are, that are related to narrow cues and ringing, which makes the, the, the mic easier to use. But beyond that, uh, as far as natural sound, uh, we, we are actually uh, heavily interested in field recording as, as our own personal hobbies. So we don't look at mics as just a spot mic and what's going down the barrel. We're constantly listening to the mic off axis, if you allow me, just because everyone's listening, Todd. And normally I'd come to a point here and you would hear either a bit of a dropout or a change in EQ or some weird phase issue, but I think that you can hear that it's really just uniformly changing as I go around. So if the levels were left the same, then I, was, I should just be getting louder and quieter, and I'll even go behind, so probably you should find a good null back here somewhere. But you see what, I, you see what I'm talking about, so. Yeah, well, absolutely, and, and this is something people sort of take for granted, that the off-axis behavior is supposed to be strange. Right. And the reality is, it's not supposed to be, it's just, again, you guys are just doing such a great job of so, answering engineering problems. Excellent, excellent. So, so that, that's key for off-axis response. Now, take that and imagine if, for instance, you wanted a pair, a pair of these mics to use them for uh, space stereo recording, where they're really the main mic for the recording. You get a real stereo image based on the sound field in front of you when you do a recording like that. Well, Part of what makes it sound real isn't the direct sound of the folks in front of you, it's the space that, are, that the room allows your brain to imagine. Well, when there's sidebars there, then the side arrival stuff is all mixed up, the phase response is wrong, and, and the ambience or the, the sound of the room that's around the direct sound gets completely screwed up, so the reality of the, of the stereo image is blurred your brain's ability to believe that that stereo image is real, not just a stereo image, is diminished. And so, it, it, it in certain applications, not just helps, but helps a lot. Um, and then, just, just as a side benefit, not the thing that we were reaching for, but just luck, is because the uh, material that we lucked upon finding to facilitate this desire was something based on the structure of a windscreen foam. Gee whiz, that's an added free benefit. We can't claim to have discovered that part of it, but it was a win-win. Now, we don't go around suggesting people that you will never need a pop screen, but this definitely helps. You know, we would say, figure, you know, give that a shot yourself, but we don't think it's gonna take away all pop, but we, we think it's gonna make this microphone such that you know, maybe half the times you need it, you don't need any pop screen at all. Um, and that said, when it comes to pop resistance, a lot of microphones will build the pop resistance in. The more you block the sound, the more you throw away. So when you don't need that, like if I was recording an acoustic guitar, building that in really hoses you because it blocks the sound from entering. Not only that, if I were to use a heavy brick of this material, eventually I'm gonna make uh, enough acoustic resistance that I start adding in more of a box around the capsule as well. And we don't want to do that. So by adding just enough of this material uh, to protect it from RF, uh, EMF, to protect it from physically getting you know, poked or damaged, um, it allows as much sound to get in there as possible without getting hurt. That said, if you do need uh, more pop resistance, you can use a pop filter externally and you're not creating a box around the mic. It's, it, there's no corresponding parallel surface to it. It's always much better to use 
exactly the amount of pop resistance or a little bit for safety, not more than you need if you want the best sound possible. So that's kind of our philosophy with this basket. And just along with that, because, because we had been thinking about this so long, you always look at what folks have done in the past, okay? And we knew this was something that we could patent. So the, before we came out with this in the first mic uh, that had it, which was the C715, which came out about a year and a half ago, we applied for a patent. And I'm happy to say about a month ago, because this takes some time, and after doing a bit of rewriting, the patent office blessed us with this beautiful looking folder with all the embossing and gold seal on it, and we now have a patent on this basket. It's fantastic. And, and we just started releasing this mic in the US about a month ago as well, coinciding with that, the 716, um, which you're listening to me right now. Well, I can say it's a breakthrough. We've got them in the studio and they, they sound magical. So thank thanks, you, Todd. thanks for continuing to move the needle. I mean, it's thank really, you for allowing really us great. to do what we do. Yeah. We appreciate it. And, th and thank pleasure. you, Sampier customers. Without you, we can't do this.